Well, I'm so happy to be here, and I know you all have been working um, all day. And so I'm just here to share a couple of thoughts um, at this point of your day. Uh, but mostly, first of all, just to thank you all. I know this is the first convening of this incredible and large group of leaders around the needs of the San Joaquin Valley. And I know that the San Joaquin Valley is thought of in many ways. Um, there was a report recently, the report you all have been discussing and studying that referred to it as being the Appalachia of California. This is also a region of our state that has some of the most beautiful land and some rich, rich history in terms of agriculture. This is also a place that is part of our state that has one quarter of the families, the children who are in families here are going hungry. Um, this is a part of our, our state that has some of the most beautiful landscaping, but also has very serious needs in terms of water and clean water and the availability of clean water. Uh, this is an area that is experiencing a population growth of two times the overall rate of growth. Um, but still has a lot of needs in terms of the challenges of a growing population and whether we have the resources and the opportunities for that population to do what it desires and needs to do. And so I congratulate everyone here, this very diverse group from all backgrounds in terms of the professional work you do and perspective that you bring to come together um, in this first step toward what I know is a plan that is coming out of this to make the voice of this valley, of the San Joaquin Valley, heard, make it loud, obviously with a a great sense of pride, but making sure that as we proceed, that this region of our state receives all of the attention that it deserves and is due. So I'm here most of all to first just thank you for the work that you're doing today and the commitment you're making for the future. Um, so, you know, I will tell you, after I got elected um, to be, become one of your senators, um, my husband and I have a, well, at, during the summer, it was one of my, first trips back home after, the, um, after I got sworn in. It was actually in the spring. And our then 17-year-old asked me to come and speak at her high school and to a, a group of seniors. And so I went. And um, it was this incredible room. It was in the school library. This incredible room full of these California teenagers. I was so excited to be there. And one of the first questions that I was asked, this young student, she raised her hand and she said, what are we going to do about a divided America? And it broke my heart, right? These kids who have been learning about the history of our country and the values upon which it was founded values we are still fighting to achieve, but those values, right, that are behind the, the Constitution of the United States and all of the amendments to that Constitution. The principles and ideals that are behind the, 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 the bill in, that we said was the Bill of Rights and a Declaration of Independence and the words we spoke in 1776 that we are all and should be treated as equals. And this group of California teenagers was asking, what are we going to do about a divided America? And so I looked at her, and I, you know, with the pain that, that that caused, I looked at her, I paused for a moment, and then I looked at her, and I told her exactly what I feel. And I said, I reject the premise. I don't believe we are divided. I believe we have so much more in common than what separates us. And here's the lens through which I think that. It's the three o'clock in the morning thought, as I like to call it. You know, you've heard of that, the, the bewitching hour, three o'clock in the morning, that, that, that moment at usually three o'clock in the morning when we wake up thinking something that's been weighing on us, wake up with a cold sweat. Well, when we wake up with that thought at three o'clock in the morning, we are never thinking that thought through the lens of the party with which we're registered to vote. When we wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning with that thought, it is never through the lens of some demographic that a pollster put us in. 
And when we wake up with that thought at 3 o'clock in the morning, for the vast majority of us, Californians and Americans, it has to do with one of just a very few things. Our personal health, the health of our children or our parents. Can I get a job? Can I keep a job? Can I pay the bills by the end of the month? Pay off student loans? Can I retire with dignity? For the vast majority of us, we have so much more in common than what separates us. And I think the challenge for this moment in time that this group of leaders is addressing is pointing out the commonality in terms of the priorities and the need then, in the midst of understanding our diversity, to see the commonality so we can bring unity. And in that way, with a unified voice, have a strong voice that is strong with conviction about what are our priorities and is strong in terms of persuasion about the need to get these things done. In fact, I came up with this equation. So this is it. So diversity, right? We are diverse. We are diverse. You can look around this room just on the faces. And then we'll start talking about our backgrounds and our interests and where we might have come from and where our people might have come from. We are diverse. That is a fact. We want to get to unity. Well, we are diverse. Plus, when we recognize our commonality, I believe we get to a closer step toward unity. And in that way, having a very strong voice. So with that spirit in mind, I know that there have been a number of topics that have been discussed this day, including health care, including immigration, environmental justice, and criminal justice. And I have a lot to say on each, but I'm not going to take up that much time. Instead, I'd like to talk about two in particular. And one is the issue um, that is one of the, the premier issues for this region and for, for most people, and that, that is the issue of health care. So I know that Stockton, for example, and this region has been hit hard by certain health care challenges as it relates for our children, for example, um, and asthma, diabetes, and opioid and substance abuse. And when we look at the fact that Californians rely on Medicare, 5.6 million Californians rely on Medicare, and Medi-Cal, 13.5 million Californians rely on Medi-Cal. I think what this region knows is that we should not be taking away health care. We should be strengthening the ability of people who need access to meaningful health care to receive that health care. I will tell you that the challenges that I see for California are that in the midst of those needs, in the midst of the needs that also are raised by not only the diversity of our needs, such as here, a challenge as it relates to clean air and clean water in other parts of our state, but also the challenges that we face because we have such a large population, the most populous state in the country, is that we are going to continue to have to fight to have in place federal policy that ensures that what is working with the Affordable Care Act remains intact and remains in place, and that we don't play politics with public health in this country. And it's going to be an ongoing challenge, guys. It's going to be an ongoing challenge. But part of the reason I am optimistic about the outcome of this is based on just recent history. There were folks that said for about seven years they were going to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. And then for the first eight months of this year, we're working on getting rid of it as a priority. But one of the things I witnessed, that I think that we all witnessed, was people came out and started talking openly and actively and loudly about the needs they have to be able to have access to affordable health care. Families with children came out and talked about that. Women talked about the need to have access to health care without being denied because of some pre-existing condition. We talked about what California has achieved with Covered California. 
around what we can do as leaders in government, in the private sector, in community-based organizations, around making sure that all of the people are informed about their rights and what is available to them so they sign up. This will continue to be a challenge. But as I walk the halls of Washington, D.C., I'm in particular, and people, my colleagues will say, California did an extraordinary job. California did an extraordinary job. And that is credit in large part to the folks in this room who are on the ground making sure that the folks in the community know what they have a right to have access to and making sure that they sign up. And the challenge is going to continue. Um, today, as you probably heard, there was an executive order issued. And um, as far as I'm concerned, from what I first heard about it, it will undermine the advances we have made, and in particular, consumer protections as it relates to a number of issues, but in particular, it has the potential to divide the insurance market between healthy people and sick people. So we're going to have a real challenge there. And again, the most important thing is that when we have a group of people coming together like this, that we make sure we get the word out to the folks who are not in this room about what they're entitled to receive and encourage them to continue to let their voices be heard about what they need. And back to the point of commonality, I will also say that the other thing that gives me a sense of optimism is that there are folks in Washington, D.C. that understand this should not be a partisan issue. Which is why you have Lamar Alexander working together with Patty Murray, a Republican and a Democrat, to come up with what we can do to improve access to affordable health care as we go forward. So I speak of this with a sense of optimism, but also with a sense of realism. And the work that has been done so far in these last several months must continue in order, I believe, to get us to the right place. I'm going to speak briefly about the issue of immigration. I have been meeting for a very long time, basically since this was in place, with DACA recipients. Dreamers who received deferred action status because they went through a process of complying with a rule and a system that was set up that says you have to give us very specific information about your background the circumstances of your arrival in this company, who are your parents, what are you doing, are you living a productive life, have you committed any crimes, that kind of thing. And after enduring that process, we told them that if you give us this information, the United States government told them, you will not, we will not, the government will not share that information with ICE. And Mayor Tubbs, alluded to exactly this conversation that we've been having in Washington, D.C. And in my position as a member of the Homeland Security Senate Committee, asking these folks who have been appointed to head the Department of Homeland Security, will you keep your promise to these young people? Will you keep America's promise to these young people and not share that information with ICE? And not one of them would make the commitment. There has been a new person appointed according to the press. When I go back to DC, I expect that we're going to have hearings about her nomination. I am hopeful that her answer will be different. I am hopeful that people who are in a position of leadership will understand that if we want to lead by example, part of that means that we keep our word when we make certain commitments, including the commitment we made to these DACA kids of which there are 220,000 in the state of California. The other thing you should know about the concern that we as California should have about this issue is this. It was an arbitrary deadline that they set up to say that when they announced on September 5th, they would give the DACA status kids one month until October 5th, last week, to renew their applications for DACA. Now here's the background on that. Within that one month, these kids had to pull together the paperwork that would be the basis of their renewal, and they had to give $495. That's a lot of money to come up with in one month. And if people aren't clear on the concept out there in DC, 
Federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. So the way I calculate that is you would have to work for about two weeks straight and not pay your bills or eat to come up with that money within one month. They're setting these kids up for failure. And so we as leaders have to stand tall for these young people. You know, we're all in this room because we are leaders. And so you all will appreciate something I'm going to tell you that is very personal, but it, it has been paining me when I talk with these dreamers and these DACA kids. That we don't have the power to right now to actually have this administration not rescind DACA. And these kids are looking at us and they are crying and they are terrified and their families are terrified. But what we do have the power to do is remind them that we are all in this together and they are not alone. And so part of what I bring to you is a request that we do what you all have been continuing to do, but make it your, your, one of your priorities to talk openly about what we intend to do to stand with these DACA kids and these dreamers during this difficult time because they are terrified. But that being said, on a note of optimism, I will also say that we have a bipartisan bill, the DREAM Act, that, which I'm co-sponsoring, along with folks like Lindsey Graham. And I do believe there is a bipartisan will to see this through. We'll see with the next steps where it goes. I am advocating that it be a clean DREAM Act, meaning no strings attached. And we'll see where this goes and where it ends up when we all get back to DC. But California's voice is so critical and so important on this issue. And again, I thank everybody here for the leadership you have been providing. On the issue of the environment, I know you've been talking a lot about that. I'm also on the Environment and Public Works Committee for the, for the Senate. And um, again, California's a leader. And I say that perhaps with a bit of bravado. But we have been setting an incredible standard. We have been setting an incredible standard around, for example, what we say we want in terms of vehicle gas emissions, and that our standards will be higher than the national and the federal level. We have been advocating, as has been happening certainly here in San Joaquin Valley, around what we need for communities to have access to clean drinking water. And so as we go forward, again, the work that you're doing right here to address the challenge here in the San Joaquin Valley will be a model for what other communities around the country are grappling with. And when I look again at the resources that are in this room, I know that we are going to move this a step forward, if not many steps forward. And again, it will be a model for the country. And then finally, on the issue of criminal justice reform, I know there's been a lot of discussion about that. And so I would like to share with you one area of focus um, for, for, for the work that we've been doing in DC on that point. And it really is a criminal justice reform issue. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue about what we need to do in terms of the, the fairness of, in the criminal justice system. But as much as anything, it is also about economic justice. And that is the issue of bail, money bail in our country. So I'll share a little bit about the background. And many of you may know the, how the system works. And so let's use the example of a woman goes you know, into a store and steals something of great value. So because it's of great value, it's considered grand theft. She gets arrested because it's a crime. She gets charged because it's a crime. And then she'll go to jail and have her first court appearance. She'll show up in front of the judge. The judge will look at the charging sheet and say, OK, I'm going to look at this other thing that's called the, the bail schedule. And for that crime, Let's say the bail is $20,000, which is the average bail in the United States. California average bail is $50,000. So $20,000. The average Californian, the average American does not have $20,000 sitting around. So let's say her family's in the courtroom. We got to get Auntie out. We got to get Tia out. So what do they do? They go across the street to what's across the street from every courthouse in America, the bail bondsman. Bail bondsman says, I'll give you the 20,000, but you have to give me 10%, which you will not get back. That's $2,000. The 
The average Californian, the average American, does not have $2,000 sitting around. So what ends up happening? Just one of a very few things. Family big borrows and steals to get that money. Or she sits in jail pending trial, waiting trial for what could be weeks, months, even years. God forbid she has young children at home and she's a single parent. That means at least those children will go neglected or maybe Child Protective Services comes and picks them up. Or equally likely, her public defender may say, well, if you plead guilty, you'll get credit for time served and you'll get out. So even if she has a defensible case, weighing her options, what do you think she's going to do? All because she does not have the money to get out. So, you know, I'm a career prosecutor. Many of you know this. I've personally prosecuted everything from low-level offenses to homicides. I was your attorney general, which made me the top cop of the biggest state in this country. So, 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 I, I come with a bit of authority on this subject, is <laughs> my point. So, let's say, for the same crime, the same offense, somebody goes in, steals the same thing, turns out they've never been caught, but they're a member of a transnational criminal organization. He's saying to his boys in the courtroom, yo, somebody write the check and get me out of here. So you see there's a disparity because the decision is not even being, if he doesn't have a record, is not even being made based on the risk that person poses to society or the risk that they don't come back. So it's not a smart system. It's not a system that is actually designed to enhance public safety either. It's an economic justice issue and it's not smart when it comes to what we need to do to keep communities safe. Not to mention that the, on the economic justice piece, guys, remember another point. That family pays the $2,000 and she shows up for court the day she's supposed to show up. She doesn't get that money back. The people who have the $20,000, they pay the bail, they show up, they get their money back. So poor people are paying a premium this is an economic justice issue. So I was talking about this, and, and I, you know, I really want to work as much as I possibly can in a bipartisan way. So I decided to walk the halls of the Senate. And I knocked on the door of this guy's office. Um, his name is Rand Paul. <laughs> He's a senator from Kentucky. And I said, I got this bill. And I'm thinking, and he listened to me, and he said, you know what? OK, Kamala. Count me in. So we are co-sponsoring this bill. And then together we actually wrote an op-ed for the New York Times, which got published. And then I, I got in touch with him to see how he was doing and was it for his people okay with it. And I said, Rand, how you doing? He said, Kamala, Appalachia loves this. Because we have much more in common than what separates us. So I'll close my point, my, my comments by just saying that. There are many challenges that are facing this region, facing our state, and facing our country. There is no question about it. And this is a room full of people that are wi eyes wide open on that. But there is also a very healthy, good place to be in that space between being a realist and being an optimist. And I think that is the spirit with which this group has come together and the dedication you are making to the work going forward. We will be realists about the challenges, about the disparities. We will be realists in remembering whatever history got us to this place, but also optimistic that unified and together understanding our commonality, we can actually move things forward and get things done. So I believe this is a great time for folks like the folks in this room, to be in this room under one roof together. And I know that this area of our state is going to benefit in untold ways because of the work you are doing. And I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you.